Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 241 of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I'm joined by Jackie Summers, founder of Sorel Liqueur, an award-winning product that's been taking the country by storm during the last several years. If you're into spirits and cocktails, you've definitely seen this product at your favorite bar or on your Instagram feed, but the story of Sorel isn't merely one of rapid growth and business success. It's the story of a cultural memory transmitted across time and space. But before we go deep into the history and flavors of the intriguing red drink served at so many Caribbean family gatherings, let's pause for a moment so that you can make yourself a drink. Since this episode will drop during Negroni week here in 2022, our featured cocktail is the Crown Heights Negroni. To make it, you'll need two ounces of Tanqueray gin, one half ounce of Sorel liqueur, one half ounce Carpano Antica formula sweet vermouth, and one half ounce Campari. Combine these ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, stir until the contents are well chilled and properly diluted, Then strain into a chilled cocktail glass up or on the rocks, garnish with a citrus twist, and enjoy. To understand why this is such a compelling Negroni riff, you need to know that Sorel is a spiced hibiscus liqueur. This means it gels equally well with the botanicals in the gin and vermouth and the redness of the Campari. On the other hand, the brightness of the hibiscus provides an upward inflection that reminds you of the first time you tried a white Negroni, and realize that the format has room enough for so many different flavors. On the surface, Sorel seems kind of like an obvious choice for a Negroni purely thanks to its striking color, but once you dive below the surface, you'll be delighted to find that it works for deeper and more essential reasons. So, now that you've got the perfect Negroni riff to send off this year's Negroni Week in style, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this wide-ranging conversation with Jackie Summers, creator of Sorel, some of the topics we discuss include how Jackie has led a life of continuous transformation on his way to creating Sorel, battling a spinal tumor, leaving a successful corporate career, and becoming America's first black distiller since Prohibition. The intriguing wellness and flavor properties of hibiscus, which has more vitamin C than most citrus fruit but can be problematic as a single note flavor. Why it took hundreds of test batches and experiments to perfect this product, which comes to us as the result of centuries of stolen bodies, stolen spices, and a resilient oral tradition that sings at the genetic level. The difference between sorrel, the drink, and Sorel the brand, by way of some apt wisdom from Jackie's childhood speech coach. Along the way, we cover the terroir of North African hibiscus, why liquor years are like dog years, what to drink with the philosopher who went toe-to-toe with Machiavelli, and much, much more. So many products we see on liquor store shelves cross an ocean to get here. But unlike the West African slaves that carried the epigenetic memory of the red drink to the Americas and passed its secrets orally down through generations, most of those foreign bottles aren't forced onto a cargo ship against their will. This conversation with Jackie is revelatory in so many important ways, not only as a retrospective on hundreds of years of hard history, but as a temperature check that shows us where we're headed. I hope it sheds some new light and perspective on how you drink and perhaps encourages you to seek out the ancestral flavor memories that are braided into your own DNA. Keep your eye out for a bottle of Sorel liqueur next time you're at your favorite bar or liquor store, but until then, please enjoy my conversation with Jackie. Jackie, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. How are you feeling today? I'm doing excellent. How about you? 
I'm doing okay. Thanks for asking. Yeah. I love morning interviews because I feel like we're both coming into it with some nice, fresh energy. And uh, your product, which we're here to talk about, Sorrel Liqueur, has a lot of storytelling behind it, a lot of history. But before we get into all of that, before we dive into your personal story, I'm hoping that you can just give us a general introduction to who you are and what you do. So my name is Jackie Summers. I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised. Uh, I am the creator of a beverage called Sorel Liqueur, which is based on a centuries-old Caribbean recipe, which itself is based on a thousands-of-year-old African recipe. I'm also a public speaker, a writer, a James Beard-nominated writer, and an advocate for all things uh, equitable for humankind. Awesome. Yeah, I've been following you on social media for a few years now and, you know, consequently following uh, Sorel. And I've always been intrigued by it, first off, because it doesn't strike me as one of those single flavor liqueurs. It's not in the, obviously, the European Amaro or Alpine liqueur kind of category. And it's not, conversely, something like an elderflower single flavor or a passion fruit single flavor, which we've seen be very popular. And so I've been dying to know kind of what goes into that kind of that in-between space that it's kind of creating its own category. And I figured I was doing some research. I figured we might get into this by having you tell the story of what I saw on your website referred to as the red drink. So can, can you just tell us that story? Absolutely. So if you went back thousands of years in Africa, Africans knew that hibiscus was a powerful medicinal plant. It's full of antimicrobials, antioxidants. It's got more vitamin C than most citrus fruit. It's uh, full of anti-inflammatories. It's a natural aphrodisiac. And the Africans would take this flower and make a tea of it and it became part of their ceremony and their tradition. Uh, so there's this all, almost epigenetic memory in the Afro-Caribbean di- diaspora of what we think of as the red drink. Flash forward to about, or flash back to about 500 years and the transatlantic trade starts and bodies and spices are stolen from the continent of Africa and traded in ports in the Caribbean, in the islands of the Antilles. Now, there's two problems I want to say right off the bat with what we think of as traditional sorrel today. Uh, The first is that hibiscus by itself, it doesn't work as a single note. It's so acidic, it's so tart, that what most people do is just bury it in sugar and then it's syrupy and cloying and just not fun. The other thing that becomes a big factor in how people balanced out the acidity of the hibiscus was what spices were being traded through your island. So if you went to Jamaica, for example, there was a high influx of uh, Chinese indentured servants. So you got ginger and cardamom and allspice with the, and of course, rum, of course, rum in Jamaica with your hibiscus. If you went deeper into the spice trade, like Trinidad and Tobago, where you had uh, East Indian indentured servitude, you got... uh, Their spices, you got hibiscus again, but maybe with cinnamon and nutmeg and clove. So there has never been a standardized version of this for these reasons. Uh, And the additional reason that the people that were making this centuries ago, they weren't actually allowed to read or write. So they couldn't write down recipes. It was all oral traditions. If you didn't watch your grandmother make this, you didn't know how. That's really interesting. One quick follow-up on the actual linguistics of the word Sorel. Um, Ah. I've seen it spelled a couple of different ways. I've seen it spelled with one R. I've seen it spelled with two R's. Uh, Does that word have either a linguistic origin or maybe sort of a spreading activation of linguistic uh, influences that you've been able to trace back? Does it have a a meaning? Is it West African? Is it more Caribbean? I'm just curious about that word Sorel. So the beverage Sorel, S-O-R-R-E-L, is called that because it is based on the Sorel uh, hibiscus flower. Uh, 
my product, my brand, Sorel, S-O-R, one single, one single R-E-L, is called that because I have a speech impediment and I can't pronounce the letter R. So for me, trying to say Sorrel is like trying to say rural or terrar. It's an awful word. But <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have eight years of enunciation class in public school. Other kids got to go play after school. I saw a speech pathologist, and here's one of the things that I learned. <clears throat> Words that end in a down sound are sad. Sorrel is a sad word. Sorrel is happy. <laughs> I can pronounce it. So I differentiate the generic beverage sorrel uh, from Sorel in that A, I can actually say the name, and B, and here's the big difference. Traditional sorrel is not shelf stable. It will last for a, a few weeks in your refrigerator because it's all organic things. Sorel, the brand, you can open it, close it, come back in a year. It tastes the same. Mm, wonderful. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things you mentioned in the process of explaining sort of the diaspora of people, ideas, ingredients, and recipes that I just want to point out as, as things that I want to highlight here. One of the phrases that you used that I thought was so fascinating was an epigenetic memory. Yes. And maybe, maybe that's something that might be a recurring thing as we continue through your story a little bit, because Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of epigenetics is that it is a sort of latent or resting quality in a gene that becomes activated when a certain set of circumstances or um, inputs are available to that gene. So it can be lying dormant and then suddenly when the conditions are right, that switch can get flipped on on the outside of the gene on top of that's what epi references and then suddenly a gene that you've had for a long time is suddenly expressing itself differently is that kind of what you were uh, talking about when you were saying an epigenetic memory with the flavors of hibiscus very much so in that epigenetics can also cover our cultural influences so you might be somewhere or taste something or smell something that you've never seen or tasted or smelled before, but there's a familiarity to it. It's because your parents and your parents and your parents' parents' parents use that thing as a cultural identifier. So even though you might not have ever been directly exposed to it, the minute you are, you know that it's a part of you. Mm. I think this is a good time to maybe jump into your personal story. Um I, it, I've done some reading, obviously. I try to do a little bit of homework. It seems like you've had quite a number of different you know, occupations throughout your life. So I wonder if you might approach the story of Jackie Summers, however you think is most appropriate for this conversation, and just kind of give us the story of how you transitioned into your role as an entrepreneur with a spirits brand. So I had 25 years in corporate life before I started uh, Sorel in 2012, five years in finance, 10 in marketing, 10 in publishing. I was a publishing executive before I left. But 12 years ago, my doctor found a tumor inside my spine the size of a golf ball. Uh, he said, you have a 95% chance of death. And a 50% chance of paralysis, if you live, you should organize your paperwork. The short version of the story is I lived, yay! Uh, <laughs> but the experience will adjust your perspective. It gave me an opportunity to really think about my life choices and my priorities. Uh, again, I had a good job making good money in corporate America, but was I happy? No. I, it might have been the unhappiest I've ever been in a work situation. Uh, I remember walking into my day job when I had one, the, convinced I was going to offer my resignation. And before I could open my fat yeah, they offered me a package. And I, I swear I didn't even read the paperwork. I signed as quickly as I could. I cleaned up my desk and I went to the very first bar I could and started to text my friends and said, I just got fired. Who wants to come hang out and day drink? 
And truly enough, all throughout the the, the the late at the late morning and and afternoon, people wandered in and out of this bar to hang out and have a drink with me. And I thought to myself, why aren't I doing this every single day of my life? How like how can I how can I arrange my life so that my whole world is hanging out with cool people in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, and having a drink and a conversation? And that's when it occurred to me, I'll launch a liquor brand. How hard can it be? <laughs> that sounds like a bit of an ominous question. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun. Uh, so, yeah, how hard was it? It turns out it's next to impossible. <laughs> it is, unless you have millions of dollars or unless you come from a liquor family, uh, it is next to impossible to launch a liquor brand. It is prohibitive by design. To get a license to make liquor, it's a 10-year background check and everywhere you've worked, everywhere you've lived, and every dime you've made. It's federal, state, and city. And if there's a comma that's that's wrong across all three applications, the whole thing gets kicked back. They want you to list the address of your lease on the application. And that process can take up to a year and a half. So they expect you to be paying rent on a space But it's not an empty space because they expect you to list the serial numbers of your equipment on your application. So unless you can afford to have a space empty and a space big enough to hold a bunch of distilling equipment that you're not using yet for about a year and a half, you can't do this. That's that's crazy. I mean, I've I've spoken to people who've gone through the process, but I f- I feel like most of them have been so traumatized from it that they've never gone into that much detail. I it, it the the sad thing is, Jackie, it doesn't surprise me, but that doesn't mean that it's any less insane, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Well, here, here's here's the crazy part. When I got my license to make liquor in 2012, when I got my DSP. I was, I didn't know this at the time, but I was the only black person in America with a license to make liquor. Turns out I'm the first licensed black distiller post prohibition that we know of. Who knew? So how did you how did you find out about that? Oh, simple. I was going into stores and restaurants and distributors and no one had ever seen a black liquor brand owner before. No one believed I owned the brand. Mm. I would go into establishments. With my product and the common response I got was, oh, deliveries are in the back. Uh, I'm not here to make a delivery. I'm the brand owner. I'll never forget one time I did a presentation at a distributor only to find out later that uh, security was watching me in the, in, the, in, the, in the waiting room. I don't know what they expected me to do. Uh, but there's, it's, it's fair to say that the liquor industry, the spirits industry, is a microcosm of society in general in that marginalized groups are still treated like second-class citizens. It is an adjustment for everyone, including me. Mm. So are there any other – so I'm, I'm trying to think about like as, as, as you're going through this process of getting these licenses, as you're going through this process of – paying rents on equipment that you can't use yet and walking into bars and liquor stores and being met with what unfortunately was the norm and still continues to this day to be the norm rather than the exception in many cases. At what point did you start to feel that first bit of traction, the first bit of the business and the product when it wasn't just fighting against a hundred percent of the stream, maybe that you were just starting to get like, you know, five or 10% of the stream going on your side a little bit. I don't know if that makes any sense the way I phrased it. Well, Brooklyn embraced me. It, if you go back a decade ago, the, all of the, all of the Brooklyn brands were just starting to drip to get, to grit their teeth in the Brooklyn retailers and Brooklyn uh, restaurants fully opened their arms to me. Uh, but what really made the first difference uh, in September of 2012, Lucky Magazine put us on their uh, in their gift guide as the gifts are given multiples for the holidays, and suddenly I was getting requests not for cases but for pallets from around the country. 
Mm. That's really great. So I'm a bit of a flavor nerd and I'm hoping that we can get into a little bit more of some of those perhaps epigenetic memories that you're bringing to this. Um, can you tell me about, from a flavor perspective, how you come to flavor from a family perspective? Because it seems like you've got some traditions in your family about people who are work who have worked with flavors and passed down that knowledge generationally. And then also, you know, maybe taking half a step back here and uh, getting into the weeds about how you developed Sorel. So my grandfather on my mother's side uh, arrived in the, this country in America from Barbados in 1920, and he was a classically trained chef. And he passed on his tradition, both culturally and professionally, to my mom, who taught me. So as young as I can remember, for me, my cultural identifiers were food. This past weekend was Labor Day weekend, and they do what they call Caribbean Day Parade on Eastern Parkway, which is something like 2 million Caribbeans of every island just show up and there's dancing and there's music and there's floats and there's costumes. But I remember being a small child and what I was most interested in was the food. There's beef patties and there was roti and there was doubles and there was jerk chicken and I'm washing it down with this red stuff that's non alcoholic, but it's for kids. What is this? So, this was part of what defined me as a person from the time I was very, very young. Uh, there was never a recipe for sorrel in my family, it was literally just watching parents and aunties make this and then reconstructing what I believed it tasted like in my own kitchen as an adult. So I was making a version of what eventually became Sorel for almost 20 years uh, for friends and family. But the difference between what you make in your kitchen and what you put into a bottle is the difference between the Wright brothers of first flight and landing somebody on the moon. Uh, this is the part where I give the caveat and I say, I am not a food scientist. So it, it took 623 failures in my kitchen before I came up with the recipe, which we now bottle, uh, which is shelf stable and perfectly balanced. It took a lot of failure to get it right. Yeah. Uh, from a, the one technical question I guess I have is when you were – trying to take this product that's often served, as you just mentioned, in a non-alcoholic format and then make it shelf stable. Obviously, that involves the use of some sort of spirit. So did you opt for a neutral spirit, something that's a little bit more neutral so that the botanicals can shine? Or when people crack open a bottle of sorrel, are they going to be experiencing some of the character of the spirit as well in that flavor profile? So two things actually happen here. Uh, the first thing is, traditionally, the people who make sorrel at home, if they want to add alcohol, they add rum. Because everything in the Caribbean is rum. Barbados is the home of rum. However, rum has its own dissolved sugars and its own dissolved particulate matter. It never bonds on a molecular level with the particulate in the base mix. Uh, both for the reason of stability and clarity of the product, just more flavor. I was the first person to use a neutral wheat grain at medicinal strength. And literally what happens is anything or any particular matter bigger than a, a molecule bonds to the alcohol and sugar and forms what we call uh, polysaccharides. It forms complex protein chains. The polysaccharides manifest as pectins. It's almost like a jelly-like substance, but it has all of the or organic material that would otherwise decay in the mix. We remove the pectins, we run it through a filtration, and everything that's left is crystal clear and shelf stable. Mm. Who knew? Who knew that pectin was going to be the villain that you needed to uh, <laughs> to take care of? Well, I will tell you that. Nobody, because I, I talked to filtration experts around the country, and all of them had the basic response of, what the hell is this? No one had any idea what to do with this when I was first making the product. I've now hired a food scientist. 
PhD chemist, master sommelier, born blind. Dr. Redler jokes and says he can see flavor and I believe him. And he's identified of the five basic botanicals that we use in Sorel, over 200 flavors that come from that combination. Hmm. So I, I, I'm just, I was not expecting the pectin thing. Is that, is, do you think that's coming mostly from the hibiscus itself? It's coming from the hibiscus. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're big flowers. I mean, one of the things that I love about hibiscus is of course the flavor is really compelling, but it's, I mean, they're also just these big, beautiful blooms. And so when you see them, you know, especially I actually, I find that they're almost most impressive when they're just past their peak and beginning to wilt a little yes. bit because you actually can see the heft of that flower, like the, the actual uh, amount of work and amount of, I guess, sun, water, and mineral resources that that plant harnessed to create that impressive bloom. And as it starts to wilt, you're like, wow, that's that's actually kind of heavy. It's kind of weighing itself down. Um, so it, it actually doesn't surprise me in retrospect that you've got some actual kind of large polysaccharide pectins that, that you had to to get out of there. So uh, I'm really glad that that we dove a little bit deeper into the weeds on, on the actual formulation of it. So um, here's, here's something you'll appreciate on the nerdy level. I specifically use North African hibiscus as opposed to Caribbean hibiscus because, as was ex explained to me by uh, my spice broker, uh, the flower is a lot like a grape varietal in that it assumes the quality of the soil that it's produced in. So a tropical flower has access to all sorts of minerals and nutrients. It does not have to work as hard. That North African hibiscus, much like that grape that's out there in the, in the arid climate, is working much harder to get minerals out of the soil in order, to, in order to survive. And that makes for a much more robust flavor. It's almost like you can, you can taste the joy in the struggle. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And plus, uh, in addition, you also have this wonderful North African tradition of yes. dried spices and teas. Yes. So, you know, like if, if you're from a sourcing perspective, I can certainly see the appeal in, you know, going there. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's, uh, it's not all that different than a conversation I recently had with Tremaine Atkinson, who took Malort back to Chicago for the first time. And yes. he, had a tremendously difficult time finding a gentian sourced from you know one specific region, but when he tried gentian from other re regions, it just didn't hit properly. So it seems yep. like you've you you solved that problem for the hibiscus, but you've also got these other botanicals in there. So a two part question here: How did you, since there, as you mentioned earlier, are so many different we might say island by island approaches to creating sorrel. How did you decide on the final blend of the other botanicals that you use in Sorel? One of the things that I do when I'm not uh, making alcohol is I'm a musician. I'm a songwriter producer. And that is all about finding the right combination of notes and synchronous position. Hibiscus by itself is overpowering and does not know how to behave by itself. But when you put it in that in the chorus and it's part of the ensemble, that's when it can really, really stand out. So what I wanted to do was design flavors around the hibiscus that truly let it sing. So at the very bottom, there's nutmeg giving it the dry finish at the end. Right behind that, there is ginger, which almost perfectly masks the heat of the alcohol. Uh, that little that little warm note is cinnamon. And the brightness that hits you immediately is the clove. But that allows all of the fruits and floral notes of the hibiscus to sing. And here's the beautiful part about that particular combination of spices. When you serve this cold, as it was traditionally served in the Caribbean and in, and in Africa, it is so refreshing and so great on a hot day. But if you heat it up, it takes on a completely different characteristic and all those beautiful baking spices come out. And then it's warm and spicy and just kind of like the best mulled wine you've ever had, but with no tannins and no sulfide, so no wine headache. Mm. 
And what is the ABV that it is bottled at? So if I'm just pouring, you know, a, a pour of this, if I were to, let's say I were to do a taste test at home, doing exactly what you described, and I took some and I served it, maybe chilled it down for a little while, and then I took another pour and then I heated it up, what would the ABV that I was consuming be if it was just straight Sorel? So it's 15% or 30 proof. And I will tell you that in part of my tests, I actually tested from 10% alcohol to 30% alcohol in half percentages to see which was the absolute best place where I could balance the spirit to the flavor. And at 15%, you're aware that there's alcohol, but you cannot taste it. 15%, the, the, the chemical reaction starts around 12%. But around at around seventeen percent, the alcohol is starting to be forward and not a part of the supporting cast. Fifteen percent is that perfect spot where both the chemical reaction that we need to have happens, and it's the right balance where the flavor is first and the alcohol is is part of the supporting cast. I really appreciate as we're going through all these little details, how scrupulous you were about the testing phase and uh, you know just the number of tests that you ran and then the really methodical stepwise process that you went through to come to these certain decisions. Because I mean, if we just rewind just a couple seconds, all I asked you was, hey, what ABV is it at? And you said, well, here's the ABV. But here's why and here's the process we took to get there. I think that is one of the things that a lot of people don't appreciate about building a brand because you don't see that. It's not glamorous. Nope. You're behind closed doors titrating alcohol to half percentages. That's not sexy. It's not fun. But to me, that's what's so compelling. I mean, yes, North African hibiscus is very compelling because of the terroir story, but I'm just as compelled by the boring half alcohol steps, if that makes any sense. Just trying to get those five botanicals in the right proportion to each other so that they're not fighting because every last one of them, ginger, cinnamon, clove, they want to be dominant. They all want to be the top dog and just finding that balance where they're, where they're complementing instead of competing was it took hundreds of tries it took hundreds of tries this episode is brought to you by near country provisions yep you've heard me singing their praises for the past year now and to answer a question i'm frequently asked yes i still do a little happy dance when my monthly subscription shows up at my door on dry ice and in an insulated bag I want to highlight a couple aspects of Near Country that normally take the backseat to their meat quality and their impeccable local sourcing, those being affordability and customization. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the price of groceries lately, but the cost of meat, even the factory farm stuff, has been skyrocketing. But because Near Country keeps things local, to the Mid-Atlantic, your meat doesn't have to travel far, and it doesn't change hands half a dozen times before it hits shelves, meaning you don't have to pay for all those markups from middlemen. Every time I do a price comparison between Near Country and the grocery store, I'm blown away by the quality that I'm getting relative to the cost. And when it comes to flexibility, I've never worked with a subscription service where I have so much control. Let's say, for example, that you've got something against pork chops. Every month, Adam and his team send around a survey that allows you to say, hey, I don't want pork chops this month, or I don't want pork chops ever again, or a more reasonable request, I'd love it if you could include pork chops in my delivery every month. Preferences change, diets change, and special requests and cuts are always on your mind at certain times of the year, and Near Country gets that. They bend over backwards to help meet your changing needs. Head over to nearcountry.com and enter the code BARCART, all one word, that's B-A-R-C-A-R-T, when you sign up for your subscription to receive two free pounds of bacon or ground beef in your first delivery. And believe me, you'll be glad that you did. Now back to the show. Another interesting thing I want to point out 
about what you were saying about the hot and cold service relative to those really strong botanical personalities is I think people are used to encountering things like cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, or uh, allspice, for or for example, like these those uh, what we might call the mold wine spices, as you were uh, describing. People are used to encountering these in cocktails, mostly with a lot of these tiki syrups like orgeat, falernum, allspice dram, spiced rums. People are used to that, but they're used to it being something that gets shaken up and something that's you know kind of taken over by the rum and the citrus juices and and all of the other aspects of generally tiki drinks. Um, but for me, it's kind of the, the light bulb moment here is like, oh, wow. Like, I don't think I've ever tasted some of these winter spices. Like we, we call them winter spices, even though they're from very warm, from warm, very places, warm places that, that, that are not traditionally, uh, you know, <laughs> like celebrating our Christian winter holidays. Um, but, uh, but it's, I, I really want to try it cold. Now just like, because the, the eugenol and the cloves is very refreshing in its own way. And ginger, obviously incredibly refreshing. We have in the, um, in the Northeastern U S we have the tradition of switchel, which has, you know, incorporates quite a bit of of ginger as well. So you're, you're really starting to connect some threads here, but you're doing it in a way that, I didn't necessarily expect, which brings me to the question of how, when you speak to bartenders or just people who are picking up a bottle of Sorel to enjoy at home, how do you talk to them about using this product? So alcohol has a problem that no one in the alcohol industry wants to talk about. And that is that alcohol does not taste good. Alcohol by itself not only doesn't taste good if it's not properly created, it can be poisonous. So humans, because we want to enjoy the effects of alcohol, have spent thousands of years trying to figure out how do we make this taste better? Do we put it in a cask? Do we put add, let, let some fruit soak in it? How do we make alcohol taste good so we can enjoy it? The big, the big liquor companies have had a generally single, singular approach to how they solve this problem, and that is that they add flavor to alcohol, which is why we have cinnamon-flavored whiskey and lemon-flavored vodka, et cetera, and so forth. My process reverses the logic. They add flavor to alcohol. I add alcohol to flavor. So Sorel is really good in one aspect, and, it, and that is this. It masks the alcohol of whatever you put it into. So if you are making a gin cocktail, you get more floral notes and less ethanol. If you're making a cocktail with Sorel and an aged spirit, rum or whiskey, you'll get more barrel notes and less ethanol. If you're making a cocktail with sake, you'll get more rice notes and less alcohol. If you're making an agave-based cocktail, tequila or mezcal, you'll get more fruit notes and less alcohol. Sorel does one thing really well, and that is push, push the flavor of whatever you're, put, you're, you're creating forward. So in that mm. sense, the bar community is doing things with it that I never imagined. God bless them. So one rider question on this. Obviously, we mentioned earlier that hi, one of the ways to work with hibiscus is to dump a bunch of sugar into it. Right. And we know you and I, that in order to call something a liqueur, following the rules of those people who made you buy all of your equipment before you could use it, you also need to add a certain amount of sugar to the product. And so how much sugar, roughly speaking, uh, I, I, I mean, most people, myself included, you know, you, you could give me a grams per liter thing. I'd be like, cool. i I'm not sure what that means, but however, however you want to describe the sh- amount of sugar that's in uh, Sorel, like what, how did you come to that decision? And I guess, how does that play into what you were just describing where it's bringing other flavors forward? So Sorel has, well, I'm not going to give the exact gram count, less sugar in it than traditional liqueurs. And that is specifically because I was trying to, knowing the beverage is usually very, very sweet, cut the sugar level back as far as I could without allowing the bitterness of the hibiscus to take over. So it's literally just enough sugar to cut the tartness of the hibiscus and no more. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I, I, as I, as I think about this, it seems like the opportunity then is that if I'm a bartender and I've got a bottle of Sorel behind the bar, the two big advantages are that one, there's less alcohol in Sorel than in most of the other liqueurs that are going to be in my arsenal on the back bar. And also it's a, it's a, you know, lower ABV, lower sugar, two things that are less. So it gives more flexibility. Do you find that bartenders are often using it in conjunction with multiple other ingredients because they have that less sugar, less alcohol flexibility? What I find is people tend to use Sorel to highlight a particular aspect of their cocktails. If they want more wood in the cocktail, like a, a Manhattan, for example, or if they want more uh, floral notes in a uh, bee's knees, for example, they're all using it in very different ways. There isn't a specific way that it is meant to be used. And I kind of feel as a creator that it is not my job to tell people how to use it. Uh, I come from a place where people drink this straight and they're happy like that. But as a person who put a product into the world, it's only my job to make sure it gets the sort of kind, compassionate care it needs to go into whatever it's going to become. It's not my job to, to, to dictate what it's going to be. I don't know what it's going to be yet. Mm. And we're 10 years in. We're 10 years in. <laughs> Uh, how have you, uh, since it's 2022 and you started this brand in, in 2012, have, have you, uh, have you had any like 10 year realizations or have you, have, have you realized like, oh, my, my brand's a 10 year old now. Like it, you know, it's, it's probably getting ready to go into middle school. I think the hardest revelation on a personal level is realizing that the decade I've spent in the industry officially qualifies me as a quote OG, like I've been doing this for a minute now, and there are people who are just coming into the industry who think of me as one of the old timers. Uh, I'm still adjusting to that idea, but it's true. Liquor years are like dog years. <laughs> it, there's a level of experience that you get in a short time that is very, very intense and not at, especially on the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial side, 10 years is a long time to be a liquor entrepreneur. It is. Yeah. Uh, well, since we're on the subject, um, do you have any advice? If, if, any, if anyone listening, whether they're a bartender or somebody who was considering jumping into their own venture, um, do you have any advice for people who are either considering it or... Um, you know, maybe currently engaged in the kind of struggle that, uh, that you have spent the past 10 years grappling with? There's two specific things I try to tell entrepreneurs who are starting out and, and, and even entrepreneurs who've been at this for a minute. Uh, the first thing is go crazy. Like it is, as a founder, it's my job to be the craziest person in my company, but to surround myself with hyper sane people. I get to go crazy because everyone around me is making sure that I'm not driving the bus off of a cliff on any given day. But it's only crazy people that can start this thing. There are lots of people, and you'll need them, that can run successful companies. But to actually come out with different ideas and to have the courage to dive into something like getting a DSP, you have to be out of your mind to do this. But the real challenge I tell people, and I said this at the ACSA uh, in, in July, going crazy is easy. Staying crazy takes real commitment. <laughs> the other uh, thing that's super important that I told people is no matter how badly you think you need the money, do not accept money from people who do not share your values. You have to put values ahead of valuations. Mm. Finding investors is incredibly difficult, but getting out of a, an, an arrangement with an investor because you no longer see things eye to eye, that's much, much more difficult. An investor entrepreneur relationship is like a marriage. 
you have to know that people are in for the long haul. You have to have similar long-term goals. Otherwise, things are going to go badly. Mm. Well, long-term goals seems like a, a great cue for me because what I was about to ask you about is what is next for Sorel in general and uh, for Jackie in particular? Are there any any projects or any anything that you're excited about as we you know look forward to the remainder of 2022 and uh, and into the future that go that puts uh, Sorel over a decade old? There's so much happening right now. Uh, the first is we launched 20 states this year. So just getting Sorel out into the world is taking up a tremendous amount of time. Uh, the government of Barbados loves Sorel. I've actually met with the Ministry of Finance, and they would like for me to build a distillery there where Sorel can be made, again, brought home, because that's, that's, that's a home of its origin, uh, and made with local ingredients by local hands. Uh, I plan to build a distillery in Brooklyn again that will be our offices and uh, hopefully a visitor center uh, because the company is called Jack from Brooklyn. It should have a home again in Brooklyn. Mm. Uh, but beyond that, there are other products like Sorel that I'm dying to get out there. Uh, Sorel was based on the concept that this obscure beverage it really was only known about by people from the Caribbean was delicious and should be known to the world. But how many other things are out there like that right now waiting for somebody to quote unquote discover them, uh, figure out how to make them shelf stable and then pro uh, and then properly market them. So my goal is to have Jack from Brooklyn as the umbrella and have a bunch of brands that are categories of one that have great cultural significance, delicious, easy to easy to replicate, uh, and can introduce new flavors to the world. Well, it sounds like you've got one template for that process in Sorel, and uh, you know if 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 the hard thing is staying crazy, then it seems like you've got a. a a couple of projects in your back pocket that might might help you stay crazy with uh, with continual recipe testing and, and experimentation and botanical sourcing uh, as we go here. I, 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 I do get to stay crazy, but I am surrounded by just fantastic humans who are in each of their respective uh, endeavors way, way better at me than anything I would contribute. I'm fortunate to have a vice president, Summer Lee, who just really is the mother of Sorel and makes sure that all of the cats are properly herded. I've got fantastic support on the admin side. I've got some fantastic now food scientists. My creative director I've known since we were children. Chris Wright is fantastic. Everyone's very, very sane. So I get to be bananas. <laughs> well, Jackie, I, I got to say I'm excited to see what some of these crazy experiments are going to yield down the road. Uh, obviously, right now it seems like you're engaged with uh, with moving pallets from state to state, which uh, I just did that for the first time. It's expensive, man. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 it is. Uh, however, once you get that traction, I'll never forget years ago I had a meeting with Mark Brown of Sazerac, and Mark said something to me that stuck with me. He said, in this country – there's movies, there's music, and there's alcohol. And if you have a good job in one of those one of those industries, you probably have a good life. Mm -hmm. Well, I am so grateful to have learned some of the ins and outs that make Sorel such an exciting product, uh, and the ins and outs of you and what drives you. Um, before we jump into a few quick lightning round questions here, is there anything else that I completely overlooked that you want to make sure that you share with our listeners, either about you, about Sorel, or about anything else before we hit those lightning round questions? I'll leave you with a toast that's been in my family for generations. My mother gave it to me, her mother gave it to her, et cetera, and so forth. The toast is call and response. One person says, may you live forever. And the other person responds with, may you never die. And I gave that toast for decades and didn't understand what it meant because everybody dies. Nobody lives forever. And then I started on, on this project and I realized 
This is not about how long you inhabit the fleshly body walking around the earth. It's about living a life worth telling stories about for centuries. So in that sense, I am very much the curator, the steward of this particular story for my generation. And it is how I am trying to keep my ancestors alive. Hmm. That's really beautiful. And again, it, it infuses everything you say from the word epigenetics in, in the very earliest part of our conversation, right, right down to, uh, to the way that you, uh, you allow those voices of the botanicals to sing. So with that, let's jump into the lightning round. First question, desert island scenario. You can interpret the desert island scenario any way you want. You can be Tom Hanks with a with a, uh, a volleyball. You can be whatever whatever the rules of this desert island. You get to choose one bottle, and it can't be unfortunately Sorel. That would be too easy because I know you would take it. And one cocktail that you could have for the rest of your life on this desert island. So, what's your one bottle that you're taking, and what's your one cocktail? I'm grabbing a bottle of Bren Estate Cask. And I'm making a brand old fashions. Mm. I just tried that for the first time this year it's, down at Tales of the Cocktail. It was amazing. It's it glorious. Was amazing. Um, it has both the accessibility of all those great fruit notes and of the backbone of a true single mold. I adore it. Mm. Great answer. Uh, so next question, what's a seemingly small... Maybe, maybe a little quirky or idiosyncratic occurrence that uh, when it happens, it always makes your day. And let's, we'll, uh, everyone's favorite answer to this is their morning cup of coffee. So we'll take the coffee off the table. What's something small and unique to you that always gives you, you know, just a little chuckle or puts a smile on your face? So I have a cat whose name is Bowie. He's named Bowie because he has one blue eye and one green eye. He's a rescue. And he sleeps curled up in the nook of my arm every single night. And he will not get out of bed until he hears me say, good morning, every day. <laughs> and it's the cutest thing ever. Like, he's just waiting for me. He's hanging out. Good morning. And then he jumps up and he's ready to start the day. <laughs> it's like you have a voice-activated cat. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, all right. Cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you enjoy with them? Just kind of paint us a picture. This is, um, there's so many ways I could go with this question. Yeah. Uh, if it's somebody alive right now, I would like to have, I want to have drinks with Rachel Maddow. I think she has interesting perspectives. If it's someone that has passed, uh, Lao Tzu, who wrote the Tao Te Ching, or or Baltasar mm. Gracian, who's my favorite philosopher, 16th century Jesuit. Oh, there's so many people. Michael Jordan. Oh, my goodness. There's so many people <laughs> I want to have just a drink with and a conversation with. That's a big question. Yeah, it is. It's a huge one. Bal can can you, uh, who's the philosopher again? Baltasar? Baltasar Gracian. Okay. Uh, is the author of my favorite philosophical treatise. It's called The Pocket Mirror for Heroes. He was a contemporary of Machiavelli. And his theory was, you don't have to be a diabolical prince. You can Anyone can have kingly qualities and, 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 and be just as aware of the way the world moves and, be, and still be compassionate. Mm. That's really interesting. I'll have to look into that because I'll be honest, I, I don't think that I've ever encountered that. So thank you. You just uh, you gave me gave me a little bit of homework to do. Um, last question here. Do you have any unusual or controversial views in the spirits and cocktail world? And I, I'm sure that you do because anybody who has had to endure the Kafka-esque experience of uh, uh, interfacing with the TTB for any extended period of time uh, definitely has some controversial views kind of beaten into them. <laughs> I mean, I think all of my views are controversial being as I am the littlest guy fighting against the giants every single day. Uh, a single view, I feel like my presence is is an agitator. Like I'm my presence disturbs the natural order of how liquor goes 
because there aren't people like me who do what I do. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if there's a single view that I have that's controversial as much as the sum of the views that I hold that allow me not just to enter this industry, but to move through it. When I entered the industry, we weren't talking about sexism. When I entered the industry, we weren't talking about ageism. When I entered the industry, we weren't talking about racism. None of, no social issues were being discussed. No quality of life issues were conversations in 2012. And now these are things that we talk about. We talk about how we can make things more equitable for marginalized groups. We talk about sexual harassment training. We talk about how not to age people out after 35. All those views are things that I've been talking about for the last 10 years. And all of them is could be considered controversial because they're wrong. And I feel like the history of progress has always been someone standing up and going, no, you're wrong. Racism is wrong. And I don't care how long this has been the way things have been done. We're not doing it that way anymore. Sexism is wrong. I don't care how long you've been doing it this way. Ageism, ableism, all these things, someone's got to stand up and go, no, this is wrong and we're going to fix it. So maybe not as much about the, I mean, we could talk about the products, we could talk about marketing, we, we could talk about funding, but the way of life, the way people in our industry live, like we've been fighting to make that better for a while. And I think that we're starting to make some progress. You were at mm. Tales, the conversations are different now. We weren't talking about these things 10 years ago. So yeah, I have got lots of what would be considered controversial opinions, but only because the world's been wrong up to now. Mm. Well, I really, you know, it, it gives me a lot of confidence knowing that uh, that you are stationed in Brooklyn, but moving your products and your voice all over the place to uh, to continue agitating, mixing things up a little bit, and uh, hopefully continuing to make progress on those very important projects, as you mentioned. Uh, and yeah, I couldn't agree more with the, uh, the, the sort of evolution of the, the conversations that are being had. Uh, Tails is a great place to go in annually and do kind of a temperature check on that. Yep. And uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So um, before we jump off here, this is the important part. Okay. How, especially for our listeners here in the U.S., how can we get our hands on a bottle of Sorel? Where do you tend to send people? Are you shipping? Um, can they buy online? All those details, the, however you want to send them to your brand. Reservebar.com is the best place right now. We are in the process of building out our online store. It'll be ready in about three weeks. But our website is SorelOfficial.com. And if you want to follow us, Sorel the brand, on Instagram, it's Sorel Official. Uh, if you want to follow me, my Instagram is the Liquitarian, L I Q U O R T A R I A N. I coined that name because my mother did not like calling her kids alcoholics. She would say, "Y'all are a bunch of Liquitarians," and <laughs> and I trademarked it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we will have links to, of course, Reserve Bar, your website, your social handles over on the show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. And uh, Jackie, this has been a blast for me. Thank you for going deep on the science and the culture with me. And most importantly, thank you for being a guest here on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. So much fun. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. 
We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here. And by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, flavor and entrepreneurship insights courtesy of Jackie Summers, creator of Sorel Liqueur, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2022.